So we want to understand this process before we can move on to the super heavy nuclei. Whether we move on or not depends on the properties of these nuclei, primarily on spontaneous fission and on the fission barrier that is located here. The black zone indicates a very small barrier and everything is divided there. Therefore, we need to find a road through the white zone where the barriers are high. Essentially, we want to see how long-lived elements are formed. Most likely, it will be element 108, with less than 180 neutrons. Not to be confused with 184 neutrons, as per the vertical line seen on the graph. And it can be reached by neutron capture, beta decay, and neutron capture. Over time, we were guided down this path when we conducted underground explosions. This is our world, and when we worked with uranium and plutonium and got fermium, we followed the path indicated by black arrows. First we captured a neutron, and then beta decay took place. And now we must continue along this path, as indicated by the orange arrows, to reach Z equals 108. So, it is possible to follow this route as well. Therefore, everything depends on whether the R process can take place. But the output of this nucleus will very much depend on the astrophysical scenario and on the properties of the nuclei that will be encountered during the process until it reaches the coveted heavy isotope of element 108 for which modern theory predicts a very long lifetime. Despite the complexities of this path, we plucked up our courage and ignored our doubts as we decided to try to look for element 108, based on the fact that its lifetime will be very long. Well, let's see, maybe we will find it, or maybe not. If we do find it, then we will see how it is formed. I would like to mention that this was preceded by an interesting chemical experiment, in which it was shown that element 108, which is a homologue of osmium according to the periodic table, behaves like osmium. Moreover, the metallurgy of osmium, which occurs in such a way that osmium is strongly oxidized until it reaches the tetraoxide state, or osmium tetraoxide, and becomes gaseous, it is pumped into another volume, noting that its boiling point is minus 82 degrees Celsius, where it is cooled and thus pure osmium is obtained. Then a stream of hydrogen is passed through it, taking oxygen, and metallic osmium is obtained. The amount of osmium in the ground is ten times less than that of gold, and therefore it is a very expensive metal. It was shown experimentally that the 108th element we are looking for behaves in the same way, only its temperature is minus 43 degrees. Not minus 60 degrees, but minus 43. Therefore, where osmium is mined, element 108 must be present too. In this sense, element 108 goes hand in hand with osmium. They are very similar. They have the same condensation temperature, and if it is preserved, then it should be enriched like osmium. Therefore, we decided to look for the 108th element in osmium. But how to go about this search? We know that osmium does not divide spontaneously, but that the 108th element does. And if it divides spontaneously, we could look at fragments of spontaneous fission, using very little substance. We did not look at spontaneous fission itself, but rather at the neutrons that are emitted during spontaneous fission. And by neutrons, we know that if we look at uranium, then there will be two neutrons. Plutonium will have 2.2 neutrons, curium 3 neutrons, californium 4 neutrons, 
dubnium-4.2 neutrons, and nubelium will also be around 4. If it is element 106, there will be 5.5 to 6 neutrons. That is, roughly speaking, each fission act is a burst of neutrons. There are about 5 to 6 neutrons in this burst. In the next lecture, we will look at how to register these neutron bursts. But in this case, of course, it is necessary to reduce the background noise produced by all neutrons, especially neutrons in the form of a flash.